We do hope that you enjoy hearing this special audiobook presentation and that it will help to light your pathway in life. This is for educational purposes only. Maslow on Management by Abraham Maslow and Deborah Stevens and Gary Hale. Forward to the new edition. 37 years later. It's amazing, isn't it, that a book out of print for almost 37 years, a book that just barely sold its first printing and then virtually vanished from view, into oblivion really, without even a whimper, has suddenly burst upon the scene, speaking just about everybody's interest. Intriguing thousands of Maslow fans and thousands of others who mistily remember his name from their undergraduate classes or when phrases like self-actualization or peak experiences or hierarchy of needs come to mind or scroll across their computer screens. Why the book disappeared still bedevils me. Maybe it was the title. I had implored Abe to use a more reader-friendly title but who was I to challenge the maze of phrases and seductive writing? The original publishers, though, went ballistic but Abe stubbornly held out for, yes, our Zykian management. But more likely, it was the Times. A rather complacent industrial America, famously supreme since World War II, was not particularly interested in business books, especially by a psychologist who had no business experience to speak of. In addition to that daunting title, a writes in a discursive manner at pieces, nuggets thrown about, rough drafts, like artists' sketches or finger exercises for the violin. The entries in this book were transcribed word for word from his journals. When Abe first showed his journals to me, I said very forcefully, you must publish them. He resisted for months, said they were just works in progress, only drafts, not academic, I'm new to this field and so on. One excuse after another. Finally, reason prevailed. I talked him into publishing his journals and then found a publisher whose editor, I'm sure, didn't truly appreciate the book's meaning, asking me in confidence if English was Abe's second language. There are sections of the book that are hilariously innocent and other parts which are terrifyingly prescient and penetrating. But there are no neat little formulaic paradigms if you can bear reading that word one more time. Nor are there 19 rules for effective anything. What you will experience throughout this marvelous book is a genie user at play with all of his elegant ruminations, a thoughtful writer who throughout his life cultivated a beginner's mind. As he says in the preface, a novice can often see things that the expert overlooks. He takes on and challenges the major management figures of the 1960s who were then writing about the industrial workplace, notably Drucker, McGregor, Rogers, and Liked. Always in a friendly, non-adversarial way, but in a way that you know must have turned those iconic heads. Drucker claims that A wrote this book to bring him and McGregor down to earth. I doubt that that was the primary motive but Abe certainly does question the assumptions of those giants. But as you continue reading, I hope you'll notice some other things as well, many of which I either missed or didn't fully understand 35 years ago. For example, Abe was one of the earliest figures to realize that, the industrial situation may serve as the new laboratory for the study of the psychodynamics, of high human development, of the ideal ecology for the human being, his prescience was also quite extraordinary. In the last chapter, to take only one example, he foresees, with terrifying accuracy the eventual downfall of the Soviet Union and America's future success because of the growth-fostering tendencies in industry. If the Americans can turn out a better type of human being than the Russians, remember, dear reader, he wrote this at the peak of the Cold War, then this will ultimately do the trick. Americans will simply be more loved, more respected, more trusted, etc. etc. There are two other things about this book I'd like to mention. One is how politically incorrect he sounds today and how downright courageous Abe has always been. Read his chapter on the Agridents, where he discusses the dilemma of democracy, what do we do with superior individuals? What do we do with extreme disparities in talent? 
He tackles issues that everybody ducked in the 1960s and are still ducking today. Abe has always asked the big questions. This book tries to deal with two major questions or moral edicts throughout but are worth repeating over and over again, how good a society does human nature permit? How good a human nature does society permit? Maybe that helps to explain my opening questions, why has the promise of republication generated such perfervid interest and why did the book so unceremoniously migrate over to the remainder shelf so soon after publication? The first question is a little easier to answer. The problems organizations face today are far more vexing than the problems they had to address in the 1960s, globalization, intense competitiveness, galloping technology, change, change, change. As to the second question, now that I reread the book, it's very clear. The book raises tremendously threatening questions and Abe always thought that the primary goal of science was to shove truth down the reluctant throat. Maybe our throats or even our minds are now ready for Maslow's profound medicine. Abe Maslow requires no explanation or interpretation. He is an open book, knowledgeable by his words and his treasured person. The first sentence in one of Abe's most important books, Toward a Psychology of Being, published in 1962, there is now emerging over the horizon, a new conception of human sickness and of human health, a psychology that I find so thrilling and full of wonderful possibilities that I yield to the temptation to present it publicly even before it is checked or confirmed, and before it can be called reliable scientific knowledge. It is all there in that one sentence, a sentence that has sentenced psychology to a new life, that has turned it inside out or more precisely outside in, to gain truth through personal experience, be a courageous knower. Science to Abe was a way of life and love, his poetry and debureaucratizing it, or as he would prefer, resacralizing it, was his goal. Abe was a conquistador, a lone one for many years always advancing with courage and charm like the most seductive crusader. He wrote in his last book, the psychology of science. The assault troops of science are certainly more necessary to science than its military police. This is so even though they are apt to get much dirtier and to suffer higher casualties, but somebody has to be the first one through the minefields. Science was his poetry, his religion, his wonder. He wrote, also in his psychology of science, science can be the religion of the non-religious the poetry of the non-poet, the art of the man who cannot paint, the humor of the serious man, and the love-making of the inhibited and shy man. Not only does science begin in wonder, it also ends in wonder. I quote lavishly from Abe's own work, because his work was his life, and to know one is to greet the other. I first got to know Abe or encounter him, like many of us, through one of his books. It was my senior year at Antioch College, and while taking a tutorial with the then president, Douglas McGregor, he recommended a book on abnormal psychology written by Maslow and Mittelman. It was a breath of fresh air. It was a book that really drew me into psychology as a calling. I'll never forget in this book, in the frontispiece, there were two panel pictures, one that showed a group of happy-looking gurgling babies in the maternity room of a children's hospital and born babies, and just beneath that was another panel showing a group of people haggard, drawn, and sallow crowded into the New York subway hanging on, with the most baleful looks, to the straps above their heads, and through the windows you could see these sallow faces. And the caption beneath these two panels was, What happened? And that's the question that Abe spent most of his life trying to answer. That was my first encounter with Abe, and my last was in Buffalo in the spring of 1968, when he was on his way to Columbus, Ohio, to visit his new granddaughter and celebrate her birth. At that time I conducted a long interview with Abe Maslow from which we made a film. He said to me at that time, right after the filming of our interview, I have to make an important decision. He knew at the time that to write at all took all the energy he could still muster. He questioned, have I written all the good psychology I can expect to write? 
It was brought to a head by Bill Lochlands, chairman and CEO of Saga Foods, marvelous offer to join him in California. He said, I hesitated for days and then, with Bertha's approval, I refused all the other offers from the major universities to go out west and to spend my full time writing. He said, I am about to cut myself adrift from all external circumstances, no Harvards, no Brandeises, I want to make a last song, sweet and exultant. Between the first encounter with Maslow and Mitt Elman at Antioch and the visit to Buffalo were crowded many lovely times with the Maslows, shimmering, genial, and warm visits, always graced by Bertha's effortless sociability, like the meandering Charles River, outside the wooden deck of their Newton home, and her crowded and sumptuous refrigerator. And always Abe, with that incredibly soft, shy, tentative, and gentle voice making the most outrageous remarks. Breakfast with the Maslow family was intellectual nirvana, good and endless food, good and endless talk, where always I had the distinct feeling of gaining energy, of being lifted off my feet. Frank, a Nobel laureate in physics, once said, I always know when I hear a good idea because of the feeling of terror which seizes me. In this respect, Abe was a terrorist, a terrorist always bursting through the barricades of conventional wisdom and outdistancing the emplaced cannon. I always sensed, when with Abe, a childlike spirit of innocence and wonder, always wearing his eyebrows, as Thomas Mann said about Freud, continually raised in a constant expression of awe. Abe wrote, about Aldous Huxley, what I consider to be actually an accurate self-description of Abe Maslow, may I mention one more technique that I saw at its best in Aldous Huxley, who was certainly a great man, one who was able to accept his talents and use them to the full. He managed it by perpetually marveling at how interesting and fascinating everything was, by wondering like a youngster at how miraculous things are, by saying frequently, extraordinary, extraordinary. He could look out at the world with wide eyes, with unabashed innocence, or, fascination, which is a kind of admission of smallness, a form of humility, and then proceed calmly and unafraid on the great tasks he set for himself. During those years, Abe was making history by remaking psychology. So many of the terms, phrases, and concepts now accepted, even into the national vernacular, are Abe's, need hierarchy self-actualization, peak experiences. And all that went into the third force of psychology is humanistic psychology. Anthony Sutich said recently, Abraham Maslow is the greatest psychologist since Freud. The second half of this century belongs to him. If the first half of this century saw modern psychology take the mind and heart out of psychology, then Abe Maslow, under heroic conditions, disinterred them, more burnished than before. He wrote, in exchange for Freud, Adler, Jung, Fromm, and Horney, we are offered beautifully executed, precise, elegant experiments which, in at least half the cases, have nothing to do with enduring human problems and which are written primarily for other members of the guild. It is so reminiscent of the lady at the zoo who asked the keeper at their zoo whether the hippopotamus was male or female. Madam, he replied, it would seem to me that that would be of interest only to another hippopotamus. For me, perhaps for all humanistic scholars, Abe's core legacy was to revive the full humanness to science by declaring all of our human experiences capable of study. He wrote, in the final pages of his Toward a Psychology of Being, all the world, all of experience must be open to study. Nothing, not even the personal problems need to be closed off from human investigation. Otherwise, we will force ourselves into the idiotic position that some labor unions have frozen themselves into, where only carpenters may touch only wood. New materials and new methods must then be annoying and even threatening catastrophes rather than opportunities. I remind you also of the primitive tribes who must place everyone in the kinship system. If a newcomer shows up who cannot be placed, there is no way to solve the problem but to kill him. For Abe, for us, each man's task is to become the best himself. 
Joe Dokes must not try to be like Abraham Lincoln or Thomas Jefferson or any other model hero. He must become the best Joe Dokes in the world. This he can do, and only this is necessary or possible. Here he has no competition. What Abe has done is to make what was religious, mystical, or supernatural natural, to give man ownership over his human potentials rather than have them arrogated by the temporal non-human institutions which at times science, business, and the church have been. He quotes Rainier Maria Rilke, who said, If your everyday life seems poor to you, do not accuse it, accuse yourself, tell yourself you are not poet enough to summon up its riches since to the creator there is no poverty and no poor or unimportant place. To big things that Abe gave to all of us, the art and science of becoming more fully human and the democratization of the soul. For these we will be forever indebted. Introduction this is not about new management tricks or gimmicks or superficial techniques that can be used to manipulate human beings more efficiently. Rather it is a clear confrontation of one basic set of orthodox values by another newer system of values that claims to be both more efficient, and more true. It draws on some of the truly revolutionary consequences of the discovery that human nature has been sold short. Abraham Maslow. Abraham Maslow. What can a set of journal entries that are nearly 37 years old teach us about managing today? We asked ourselves that question when Anne Kaplan, Abe's daughter, approached us with the idea of republishing them. Our answer is that Maslow's ideas about work, self-actualization, and the influence of business in developing the good society are some of the most profound thinking we have discovered in nearly 20 years of studying leaders. We immersed ourselves in Maslow's work, his published books, articles, and personal papers. Although we had always equated Maslow with his hierarchy of needs theory, we discovered in his work a collection of research and wisdom and insights that were decades ahead of its time. His pioneering work in the field of management, creativity, and innovation speaks to us today in a voice that makes current work and thinking appear almost obsolete. Maslow's theories regarding self-actualization and work, customer loyalty, leadership, and the role of uncertainty as a source of creativity, paint a picture of today's digital age that is profound. The future Maslow describes in his journals is the world we live in today, the digital age. A world in which human potential will be the primary source of competitive advantage in almost every industry, every organization, every institution. Maslow's work makes us question whether we understand the crossroads we have come to. A crossroads, where in our effort to just keep pace, we will need committed, educated, and highly motivated people at all levels, crossroads where compliance or authoritarian means of leadership no longer work, crossroads where the needs of society and the needs of a business are becoming so intertwined that if one entity is dysfunctional the other will suffer the consequences. Yet, are we prepared to go forward? We speak the language of this new frontier, but have yet to embrace the meaning. We need look no further than our new vernacular for people, intellectual capital, human resources, knowledge workers, and all of the other terms we have invented to disguise the fact that what we are speaking of are people and their untapped potential. People spend too many hours in organizations and institutions that do not support them in reaching their true potential. We believe this should be as much a driving force as financial management, product development, return on investment, and all of the other indicators we put into place to measure success. Without this force, our successes will be short-lived, our plans nothing more than short-term and our ability to continue to compete in a global world severely restrained. Perhaps it is time we embrace Maslow's words and truly believe that we can create organizations which fully tap the true potential of people. Building Great Organizations In bringing back the journals of Abraham Maslow, we set out to prove that his theories and ideas were, in fact, possible. Our journey took us to leaders in a wide variety of industries. We asked these leaders to discuss their thoughts on Maslow's words and their own struggles and triumphs in building enlightened organizations. 
We would like to thank the numerous leaders who gave their time to read these journals and who allowed us time to explore their thoughts, Mort Mayerson, former chairman, Pero Systems, Warren Bennis, University of Southern California, George McCann, Chairman McCann and Aliyah, David Wright, Chief Executive Officer, Amdal, Linda A. Lepin, Chief Executive Officer, Pebble Soft Learning, Brian Lenin, Director, Village Enterprise Trust, Sherry Rose, Former Director, Apple University, Michael Ray, Stanford Graduate School of Business, Jackie McGrath, Insight Out Collaborations, Anne Robinson, Former Chairman and Co-Founder, Wyndham Hill Records, Michael Murphy, Co-Founder, Esalen Institute, Andrew K, Founder, KPRO Computers, Tom Kosnick, Professor Engineering and Global Marketing, Stanford University, Stanford Engineering Students in IE 292, Aspen Ski Company, Pat O'Donnell, Chief Executive Officer, Aspen Ski Company, Richard Keresh, Co-author, Fifth Discipline Handbook, Founder, Learning Organization Dialogue, Art Kleiner, Co-author Fifth Discipline Handbook, Author, Age of Heretics, Alan Weber, Co-Founder, Editor-in-Chief, Fast Company Magazine, Ken Morris, Co-Founder, PeopleSoft, Dr. John Popolestone, History of American Psychology at the University of Akron, Dr. Edward Hoffman, Author, The Right to be Union, A Biography of Abraham Maslow, Alan Wernick, Attorney at Law, Columbus, Ohio, John Glasser, John Wiley and Sons, Incorporated for her enthusiastic support of this project. We would like to thank Ann Kaplan and Ellen Maslow for persisting in their efforts to bring their father's work to a new generation of leaders and managers. Their gift to us was significant, through the process of bringing their father's journals back to life, we ourselves have become better educators, better leaders, better parents, and better human beings. Deborah C. Stevens Gary Hale July 1998 The Center for Innovative Leadership San Mateo California Dr. Abraham H. Maslow in front of his home Auburndale, Massachusetts circa 1965. Abraham Maslow. The man and his work. Sometimes I get the feeling of my writing being a communication to my great-great-grandchildren, who, of course are not yet bomb. It's a kind of an expression of love for them, leaving them not money, but in effect affectionate notes. Bits of counsel lessons I have learned that might help them. Abraham Maslow left a legacy for all of us. His pioneering work in the field of humanistic psychology has made an indelible imprint on the way we view ourselves, our lives, and our institutions. Maslow began his career at Brooklyn College where his unusual combination of confidence in his subject and personal humility made him very popular with his students. Many students recalled that it was his love of psychology and his enthusiasm for the science of psychology that led them to careers in the field. Maslow left at Brooklyn College to become chairman of the Department of Psychology at Brandeis University. He was also president of the American Psychological Association from 1967 to 1968. Although Maslow conducted research and studies in a myriad of areas, he is most remembered for his hierarchy of needs and the concept of self-actualization as the highest motivating force. From his work, people began to form a more positive framework for human motivation and human potential. Referred to as the father of humanistic psychology, Maslow broke ranks with the behaviorists and Freudian-aligned practitioners and academics to postulate a much more enlightened theory about mankind. A prolific writer, he authored hundreds of articles on topics ranging from creativity, enlightened management techniques, human motivation, and self-actualization. His most popular book, Toward a Psychology of Being was the kind of book passed around from person to person. Described as a book that not only inspires, but changes people's lives, it catapulted Maslow into the national spotlight. Terms such as self-actualization and peak experience became household words, integrated into the vernacular of the turbulent 1960s. 
Maslow's defining work was perhaps his development of the hierarchy of needs. Maslow believed that human beings aspired to become self-actualizing. He viewed human potential as vastly underestimated and an unexplained territory. The now famous pyramid has come to illustrate his concept. In the summer of 1962, Maslow kept a journal while at a factory in Southern California. The journal, originally mimeographed, was entitled Summer Notes. The journal first appeared in print under the title EU Psychian Management and was known mainly to academics and business theorists. It is being republished today under the title Maslow on Management. Abraham Maslow died in June 1970 at Menlo Park, California, at the age of 62. Preface to the first edition. I have made no effort to correct mistakes, to second guess anything, to cover up my prejudices, or to appear wiser or more knowledgeable than I was in the summer of 1962. These journal notes were made during the summer of 1962 when I was a sort of visiting fellow at the Nonlinear Systems, Incorporated plant in Del Mar, California, at the invitation of Andrew K., President. I came there, for no specific task or purpose, but I became very much interested in what was going on there for various reasons which will be apparent in the journal itself. This is, however, not at all a study of a particular plant. It was the plant that opened up to me a body of theory and research which was entirely new to me and which set me to thinking and theorizing. I had never before had any contact with industrial or managerial psychology, so the possibilities for general psychological theory hit me with great force, as I read first the books by Drucker and McGregor that were used as textbooks at nonlinear. I began to understand what Andrew K. was trying to do there, and I read on voraciously in this fascinating new field of social psychology. It has been my custom for some years to write to myself in a journal, to think things out on paper, sometimes freely associating and improvising, sometimes writing from previously worked out notes and outlines. This journal, however, was not handwritten as usual, but dictated on a tape recorder because I had available to me several excellent secretaries to transcribe the tapes almost immediately. This is something that happens very rarely to a professor. It accounts in part for the unusual amount of manuscript produced. These notes were bound together in a mimeographed book without editing, addition, subtraction, or other change, beyond correction of typographical and grammatical errors. They were further edited for the present book, but this was primarily to pull together the scattered memoranda that belong together, to remove some obscenities, to clarify sentences that might be confusing, to fill in references, to make it here and there a little less personal and intimate, etc. I have made no effort to correct mistakes, to second guess anything, to cover up my prejudices or to appear wiser or more knowledgeable than I was in the summer of 1962. Nor has much been added or subtracted. That would be indirect contradiction to the point of publishing a journal at all. These notes should be understood primarily as first impressions and first responses, of a theoretical psychologist taking his first look at a new field of knowledge and realizing that that body of knowledge was of great import for various of his theoretical concerns and vice versa. I have learned from other such experiences that the novice can often see things that the expert overlooks. All that is necessary is not to be afraid of making mistakes, or of appearing naive. I have appended my complete bibliography, including reprintings, translations etc. as much for my own convenience as for the readers. I want to have it in print someplace so that I can refer to it when I need to. Numbers in parentheses in the text refer to the numbers in this. Bibliography. Utopian and normative thinking of this sort is not very common these days, and even when it does occur, is by many rejected as being not in the realm of acceptable knowledge, much less in the realm of science. Science even social and human science, 
is supposed to be value free, although of course I would maintain that it cannot be. Anyway, this journal is a sampling of the kind of normative or ideal social psychology that I've been trying to work up. I've coined the word EU psychia and defined it as the culture that would be generated by 1000 self-actualizing people on some sheltered island where they would not be interfered with. Then, by contrast with the classical utopian and dystopian dreams of fantasies, the questions become quite real, for example how good a society does human nature permit? How good a human nature does society permit? How good a society does the nature of society permit? Since we know more about the heights to which human nature can attain, we can now extrapolate to the higher forms of interpersonal and social organization which this taller human nature makes possible in principle. We might, if we wished, call this simply planning. Or we might get more flossy and call it the history of the future, or use the newly coined word cybercultural. But I prefer the word EU psychian as implying only real possibility and improvability rather than certainty, prophesy, inevitability, necessary progress, perfectibility, or confident predictions of the future. I am quite aware of the possibility that all mankind may be wiped out. But it is also possible that it won't be wiped out. Thinking about the future and even trying to bring it about is, therefore, still a good idea. In an age of rapid automation, it is even a necessary task. But the word, EU psychia, can also be taken in other ways. It can mean moving towards psychological health or health ward. It can imply the actions taken to foster and encourage such a movement, whether by a psychotherapist or a teacher. It can refer to the mental or social conditions which make health more likely. Or it can be taken as an ideal limit, that is, the far goals of therapy, education, or work. Since this journal was first written in 1962, Nonlinear Systems has had to weather a contracting demand for its products along with increased competition for this contracting market. Because this journal was not a description of this one firm, I have not had to change my mind about any of the principles set forth in it. But it is worthwhile to reiterate here what is stressed in the journal again and again. That these principles hold primarily for good conditions, rather than for stormy weather. The parallel contrast in the motivational life of a single person is between growth motivation and defensive motivation, homeostasis, safety motivation, the reduction of pains and losses, etc. The healthy individual can be expected to be flexible and realistic, that is able to shift from growth to defense as circumstances may demand. The interesting theoretical extrapolation to an organization would be to expect it, also, to be flexibly able to shift from fair weather efficiency to foul weather efficiency whenever this became necessary. It appears to me that just about this has in fact happened and is happening at nonlinear although of course this should be demonstrated by research.